Okay, good morning everybody. So we are continuing our study of the 1689, and uh, you know that's just uh, affectionately what we continue to call it, the 1689. We'll talk about the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, and uh, 1689 being the year that it was finalized and, and published, and so we've talked about this for I don't know, several weeks now, maybe upwards of near two months that we've been in our study. I just lose track of time. It just flies every day. You know, it seems to be the same. And, and uh, so my timeline could, could be to totally off there. But we've been coming through this first chapter. And the first chapter of the confession is on the Holy Scriptures. So let's, uh, by way of review, let's kind of throw some questions out there. Let's get you guys involved right at the top. I see some circling in the notebooks. I love that. Uh, see you writing your notes, and, and so let's recall and remember where we've been uh, with the Holy Scriptures. And remember, with the, the totality of the confession, what's the point? What's the purpose? Why are we studying uh, this confession? Is it good for us to be studying this? Uh, is it a waste of time? Should we just, um, you know, jump back into a book of the Bible and continue that process? Or uh, is, is there a usefulness in times like this that we take breaks and we go through doctrinal teachings like this? What do you guys think? What do you guys have for me? We certainly value your input, so let's, let's have at it. And, uh, yeah, what do, you, what do you guys think? Crickets. Uh, I'm, more, <laughs> I'm more for just the Bible. Yep. Yep, that's good. And that is good. And that is certainly what everything we do comes out of. So why do you think we think it's important to do studies like this? I think it's good because it shows what you believe and why, but it kind of picks a couple of hot topics so that you can just kind of go through and um, see some fundamentals of what you believe without going through the entire Bible. So like when we do a Bible study, it seems like it takes a year or two for one book because there's so much, you know what I mean? So this is just a, a quicker overall mm -hmm. is what I thought, which I'm for. I like, the, of course, the Bible too. <laughs> Good. Well, the, the Bible is the foundation of yes, this document yeah. too. So Thank you. It's just uh, so we are going through the Word. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's right. scripture references throughout saying this is where we get this mm -hmm. belief from. So it's not that we're not using the Bible; we obviously are, but it definitely gives us a good, like like Joe said, a good overview of our beliefs and the foundation. And, good. Um, shows why we believe what we believe, and right. it helps us to understand um, the foundation that where it came from and right. what we're being taught. So good. Youth, what do you guys think? We got two adult answers. What do you What do you guys got? What do you think? Why are we studying something like this? Is it good for us to study something like this? And as Matt said, it is. Uh, it's full of scripture and just the language and the verbiage of it. You can see it. And then obviously we have all the scriptures from each paragraph um, that you know from the scripture. The paragraph is derived, so it's it's coming directly from the scriptures. What do you guys think? Any inputs? Lizzie, KK, anybody? What do you think? <laughs> I put him on the spot, you know? Jackson, anything, you guys? I know you're here for the first week, so thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so look, we are, we believe, the pastors here believe, that we're to be confessional. Uh, our faith is confessional. And, and we say that to mean confessions have been around there in the Bible. Uh, what we believe about the Bible is important. What we believe about God is important, right? That's the first and foremost thing. So how do we know what we know about God? From his word, right? How are we saved? From his word. Um, how are we sanctified? How, would he, how do we grow? Through his word. Uh, what, how do we know what we believe about what his word is? Uh, how do we know what we believe about Christ, about the Trinity, about the Holy Spirit? Uh, these things are confessional. When, when you say to, when I say to someone, hey, John, what do you think about Jesus Christ? <clears throat> he will give me an answer <clears throat> that will come from his view of what he's learned in the scriptures about Jesus. However, you can ask a Jehovah's Witness the same thing and a Mormon the same thing. Do they believe in Jesus Christ? They do. Do they believe the same things about Jesus Christ that we do? No. How do you know that? Now you're getting confessional. How do you know what you believe about Jesus? How do you know what you believe about the Bible? You have to, to understand these things and dig these things out. Remember, we call that systematic theology. 
the systematic approach of through the Bible, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about the scriptures? What do you believe about end times? What do you believe about salvation? What do you believe about angels? All, all these different areas of, of theology, and how do you get to know those things? Uh, certainly, uh, to, just to make a, a point, preaching and teaching through books of the Bible is you know, our, our go-to. That's our forte. That's what we do. And that will help you, but we've got to connect the pieces. We have to put the pieces of the puzzle approach of theology. Does that make sense? If, if we just go through books of the Bible, uh, you know, will it be the same of as the eschatology study that we just did? The eschatology study we just did went through studies all over the Bible and informed us and shaped us. This is what we believe about eschatology, where you might not have gotten that if we just taught through the book of Revelation. Does that make sense? So we, we would say uh, studying the Bible, preaching the Bible, teaching the Bible, doing confessions and creeds and all those things, we would say it's not, it's not um, either or, it's both and. Right? Does that make sense? It's both and. They are both beneficial. Uh, and so it's beneficial to be uh, well-rounded. And so that's why we do this. Okay? So, uh, but with that being said, we're not going to go through the entire, you know, 32 chapters of this in one straight shot, as we've already mentioned. Uh, we're going to break it up and get into uh, our next study will be on the book of Ephesians. So we'll get into that shortly. And then we'll kind of go back and forth to build uh, the foundation. Right? We always want to continue to build on the foundation, which is Christ. And, and build on that foundation of what we believe the doctrines of scriptures to be, okay? So, um, good. So, thus far, we've looked at a few of the attributes of scripture. Uh, remember, I've, I've given you four of them over the last uh, six weeks or so. Anybody can, can name those for advanced Jedi points and uh, maybe some gummies that I might find and throw at you? Uh, what do you guys got? Look back in your notes. Anybody remember? What, what are the four attributes of Scripture that we have seen? Uh, and that was, we finished up paragraph seven last week. And so in the first seven paragraphs, we've seen these four attributes of Scripture. What, what are those? Anybody know one or all of them? Oh, Jay wants the gold star. He wants the gummies. Authority, sufficiency. That's good. Uh, necessity, authority, sufficiency, and what? And clarity. Good. So necessity of the scriptures, uh, the necessity because we've already spoken to that, that uh, how are people saved? By hearing the word of God, by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? The authority, uh, scripture is self-authoritative, uh, right? Uh, it is apparent that it's God's word because the evidence of it points to it being God's word. Uh, and so in, in that, though, we understand how do we come to the revelation that this is God's word and not just some writing that men wrote to make these stories up. How do we come to that conclusion? Spirit reveals it to you. Amen. Holy Spirit, right? So we know it's the work of God that has to be done, but when that happens, when we read this book now, everything in it makes it clear, right, that this is God's work, that this is how he's chosen to reveal himself to us. And so in that, the next point is that, that the scriptures are sufficient, right? The sufficiency of scripture, meaning that they are sufficient uh, like we talked about last week, not for every single thing in life. Um, you know, these, if these kids are learning trigonometry, uh, it's not that I'm going to take them to the Bible to learn trigonometry, right? Uh, but it's sufficient to what then? What, what then are the, are the scriptures sufficient for? Life. Good. Life in the, in the Christian life, really, right? Yeah. The Christian life. Uh, they're sufficient for, uh, and, and that goes along with the clarity. We talked about both those together last week. Because the scriptures, are some scriptures more clear in passages than others? Yes, yes certainly. Um, but the sufficiency of the scripture speaks to the most clear thing in scripture. So if the most important thing, uh, let me put it this way. The most important thing should be the most clear thing, Right. Uh, often you'll hear me say, like, keep the main thing the main thing, right? So when we're preaching, when we're teaching, what's the main thing? Out of this entire book, youth group, here's a big lob. Out of this entire book, what is the main thing? Somebody tell us. What's the main thing and the main purpose of the Bible? To give God Good. His glory. Good. See, I got two of them. Y'all got to be fast. <laughs> Y'all got to be quick. The gospel, right? Salvation through Jesus Christ. And that is clear. Right? Scriptures are very clear on that. And then to Jose's point, it's the spirit that must convict us and convince us of that truth. Uh, but there are different, you know, clarities in different scriptures. And we looked at that last week to say, 
Um, you know, God has even gifted uh, men and women differently to understand the Bible differently. Uh, so the Bible is more clear to someone that God has gifted with the, the gift of better understanding, of teaching and those types of things. And that's why it's important for us to help one another, right, to grow in this, in this process. Because Greg may understand a, an area of, a better than Matt does and vice versa. And so it's good to have that. And then God certainly gifts, you know, the, the, um, the church with pastors and teachers uh, to do that. And so uh, those are important, significant things. Okay, so let's get into paragraph eight. <coughs> Excuse me. Paragraph 8 speaks to the providence of God, which is, again, just amazing as I uh, see this coming together again this morning. Um, I'm going to be preaching, actually, uh, in next hour about God's providence. Uh, so it is providence that he has done this for Sunday school and for next hour. Uh, but it speaks to his providence, speaks to his preservation of the scriptures. Okay, let's look at uh, paragraph 8. The Old Testament in Hebrew... And the New Testament in Greek, that is to say, and their original language before translation, were inspired by God at first hand, and ever since, by his particular care and providence, they have been kept pure. They are therefore authentic, and for the church, constitute the final court of appeal in all religious controversies. All God's people have a right to, and an interest in, the scripture. And they are commanded in the fear of God to read it and search it. Circle, highlight, ding, 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 right? As, as if I need to beat you over the head with that any more than I always do, uh, in, including myself in that head beating. All God's people have a right, you see that? And an interest in Scripture. If you're truly saved and you've been truly uh, converted, <coughs> you have an interest in the Scripture. Okay, you should have an interest in the scripture. You'd have, you should have a desire in the scripture. You should have a desire to be in, in the room and listening to teachings, listening online, watching, you know, your favorite preachers and teachers that are uh, certainly healthy and, and good ones to watch. Um, and if you've got questions about that, we can talk about it later. And it says you're commanded in the fear of God to read it and search it. Doesn't God's word command us and tell us to study his word and know his word? Uh, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Think of David in Psalm 119, right? Uh, just over and over and over, um, you know, in the Psalms, everywhere, to, to teach me your truth, O, o Lord, you know? Uh, next sentence. But as the Hebrew and Greek, <coughs> excuse me, are not known to all such readers, probably speaking to everyone in this room, anyone, anyone can read Hebrew or Greek? So there, that's exactly applicable to everyone here, right? So... Uh, not known to such readers, Scripture is to be translated into every human language so that as men thus acquire knowledge of God, they may worship Him in an acceptable manner and through patience and comfort of the Scriptures may have hope. We find hope in the Scriptures, Amen. right? Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Where do we meet Him? In the Scriptures, right? In, in God's Word. So we believe that the scriptures, and as it says here, the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek were inspired by God. That's 2 Timothy 3.16 again, right? We keep going back to that every week. Somebody give us 2 Timothy 3.16 from memory. Somebody's got it, I know. What do we got? We can all collectively maybe do it. All scripture is what? Inspired by God. Inspired by God. Good. Breathed on. And good. Breathe out, inspired by, coming from the breath of God. And it is good for what? It is profitable for what? Instruction. Good. Give it to us, Jay. Doctrine, teaching, reproof, and instruction. Good. Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in all righteousness, which is what we've been talking about, right? This is what the Holy Scriptures are to us. And that's why they are the final authority. They're the final authority in our life. They're the final authority in the church, right? Uh, this isn't my church. This isn't Brian's church. This isn't Steve's church. This is Christ's church. He's the head of the church, right? Uh, we are all the body of Christ, and so it's his church. And, and so it says here that ever since then, ever since those original languages, throughout the translation processes that have happened that we've talked about before, um, and the canonization back in, I think it was paragraphs, what, four and, four and five maybe, um, it says, by his particular care and providence, they have been kept pure. That's important and significant. Why? Because if we don't believe that, then we have huge problems. If we 
think that, well, there were these men that sat in these rooms and these councils, and they picked which letters went into this book, and it's just man's choice. And so that's how it worked. And if that's what you believe, then you're going to have a problem believing God's word is God's word. Yep. Right? Why would I say that? Why, why do you think that's the case? Or is it the case? Do you think it's not true? It's not so. There's a perfect excuse for a non-believer or somebody that's not really in the word to use that, you know, as, you know, not to believe. Saying, well, wait a minute. If these are ordinary people like me and you that did that, and then that's, that's I mean. Good. Yeah. Uh, we've got to believe that, yes, those councils were done. Yes, those men made those decisions. But if we are truly believers and believe the truth of the scriptures, we have to believe that God's hand was upon all of that. That he truly does orchestrate all things. That's what his providence means. <coughs> is that, God bless you, is that everything is under his orchestrating, under his doing for his purpose. So if he gave us his word... Do you think he is able to preserve it through the course of the history of time yes. and through men's decision-making process of what letters go in there? Do you think the Holy Spirit could have yes. inspired them to collectively come to the same point of what books go in this word? No doubt. If you can't believe that about God, then you're missing the first belief about God, that he is God. Yep. Okay? Uh, so we've got to believe that. Okay? Uh, let's go to Isaiah 8, verse 20. And um, first person that gets there maybe can, can read it for us. Now everybody's going to go slower. <laughs> now everybody's going to turn slower. I should have said that. But uh, 820, if somebody can get that. And this is one of the, the scriptures listed here for this paragraph. And let's, uh, let's see what it says. Who's got it for us? Nice and loud. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have, not, they have no dawn. Good. They have no dawn. What does that mean? Uh, they haven't been illuminated, right? They're still in darkness. They have no light. Um, and so if they don't speak to the word and go to the word, then they're in the darkness. And that's kind of what Jose was just, was just saying, uh, right? It says to the teaching and the testimony, referring to God's word. Um, and we're going to look more at that passage. It's listed in, in another one coming up as well. So the scriptures are God's word, right? They testify of Christ Jesus. Um, John 5.39, the next one there, speaks about how that's where Jesus says, The scriptures bear witness about me. Right? As he tells the disciples and he tells all those listening to him. Uh, the, book, the, the books of Moses, the prophets, uh, you know, the Psalms, they all speak of me, is what Jesus says. And so the word speaks to uh, Jesus and, and points us to him. Acts 15.15, 15, the next one there. Um, somebody flips to that real quick. Acts 15.15. 15. Huh. No, just at the end of it, it says they have no dawn. What does that mean? Yeah, that's what I was saying is they have no light. They have no revelation. The okay. They're in the dark, right? Kind of like the dawn of the day, gotcha. right? As the sun comes up. Yeah, they're still in the night and in the darkness. Amen. Acts 15, 15. Anybody got it? You know, it's something to do about uh, the words, of the, this, the words of the prophets. the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. Okay, so the words of the prophet agree, it says. And, and actually... Ironic, but not, because we would say, what? It's providence, again. The Acts 15 is, uh, is the council at Jerusalem, when Paul and Silas come, uh, or Paul comes off uh, with Barnabas off the first missionary journey, and they have some contention by some of the Judaizers, and they go to James, and they go to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, and they have a council, and they come up with, <laughs> what are the things that we believe we should tell the Gentiles about the faith? And so that is actually the first council that you see pretty much in church history. It's right there in Acts 15. You see a church council. And then we've talked about the Council of Nicaea. In our church history study, we went through seven uh, ecumenical councils if you want to get into history and, and you like things like that. Um, if you do, probably most of people in here think there's something wrong with you. But I don't. I think it's awesome. So um, study up and keep at it. So God gave us his word. Okay, Romans 3.2. Uh, is where Paul in chapter 3, verse 2 there says that the word was entrusted to the Jews, right? The, the Old Testament is written in what language? Hebrew. Hebrew, right? To the Hebrews, as we're studying and we're talking about uh, Abram, right, is the, the birth of the Hebrew nation. He is the first Hebrew. And so uh, the Hebrew language is the, is the people of Israel, is the Jewish people of God. And so he gave the word to those people. And then through that, after that, to all, right? To all of us. Yes, sir. 
when, when we talk about Timothy 3.16, the word was inspired by God, is, was it what the Hebrew was the one that was most inspired? Yeah, the Hebrew and the Greek. It would right, be the, the two. Greek would be the, the New, New Testament. Testament, but more on the Hebrew side as nope. far as not? I would say, nope, because, and why would I say that, I guess? Okay, Christ spoke in the New. Sure. Which is God himself, I'm saying, but mm -hmm. is the Hebrew more... More no, authentic. because to your point, like saying Christ was there and spoke in the flesh, Amen. but but all oh, this is Christ, Amen. right? All this is inspired by God. So every man out of the 40 men or so that wrote this Bible, every one of them was inspired by the same God in the same way to write right. the okay, truth somebody had. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that anyone is more inspired than less inspired. In the original, and that's why it starts with that, the original languages are the original inspired word of God. Because in translations... Mm -hmm. There are, we have to add words and take words right, away right. and change it a little bit to make sense in our dialect, okay? Uh, the Hebrew and the Greek don't translate directly to English. You right. can't just do word for word. There has to be a little bit of adding words to make it make sense, uh, but it doesn't change the meaning, okay, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so, so, yeah, it, when they change it, it's not directly inspired because that's a man translating. That's why they're specifying and saying the original languages were directly inspired by God. Right. But it continues to say after that uh, that it's, it's still to be translated into every human tongue. So let's continue to look, to look at that. It says uh, scripture is to be translated into every human language. And why would that be important? Well, why should that be a priority for us in the church that this word is translated into all these languages. So nobody can lie on so everybody can know the word of God. Yeah, so everybody Good. can be saved. Youth group, you, you with me? What do you guys think? Why is it important that we translate the Bible into all these languages? So that people know Jesus, right? Amen. People know Jesus. Um, young, old, boy, girl, man, woman, <laughs> right? Africa, Asia, uh, so many dialects just in, just in Africa right of of languages and things and so it's important uh for the church to continue efforts to translate bibles into all these native tongues right because how are they going to come to know jesus christ by hearing the word uh and so certainly we can go and learn their dialect and speak the word to them but how much more beneficial to translate the bible into their language so they now have the word for themselves right and that's the benefit that we have and that's the luxury that we have and so what a what a great gift that we have it says so that and, and giving our answer it says it right here so that men can acquire the knowledge of god so this speaks again to the necessity of scripture right and salvation that for men to come and acquire the knowledge of god they need to hear the scriptures and they need to read the scriptures for salvation uh, that we can better know him and it says also uh, that we can may worship him in acceptable manner Okay, so, so where is it that we learn to worship God? How do we know how we should and shouldn't worship God? It's in the Bible, right? Uh, that's going to be the easy answer for the questions in, in this first chapter, right? Is we know it from the scriptures. We know it from the Bible, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians 14 going to look at uh, verse 6 to 12. Now, I will preface this by saying we're not going to get into, I'm not going to get in a big rabbit trail about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That is what uh, 1 Corinthians 12 is about. That's what 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about here, uh, about prophecy and tongues specifically. Prophecy meaning speaking the Word of God and teaching the Word of God. That is more beneficial uh, than speaking in tongues. And with that, I want you to understand that it's clear that tongues are uh, known dialects and understandable languages of people groups. Uh, think of Acts and Pentecost when all the disciples were given different languages. What was the purpose of their tongues? That's what it was called, but it means languages. They went out and spoke languages to all the people groups that were there gathered around Jerusalem Pentecost, and the people said that... How is this that these Judeans are speaking my language? That we are hearing the word of God in our own language. That was the purpose. That God was evangelizing to all these people in different languages. How would he do that? By speaking their language to them. You understand? Uh, speaking in tongues is not a private prayer language of babbling uh, that we see in the charismatic movements and in different, uh, different 
movements throughout the church, okay? So for those of you that haven't been through lessons and teachings of, with us, that's where we stand on those two things. Tongues are real languages spoken by people to other people that understand what they are saying. And prophecy is speaking and teaching the word of God, okay? So in that context, uh, let's look at this. Verse 6, Paul says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues... What will I profit? Uh, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of uh, knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, and producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction of tone, how will it be known what is played on the flute or harp? You see his point? If you're just babbling in something that no one understands, what good is it? It's not any good. You need to understand the notes. Someone needs to hear what it means. That's the point of it all. Verse 8, for the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air, meaning it's pointless, it means nothing. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian. Uh, or an uneducated person, right? One that doesn't know the language. And the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. And that's the point in all the spiritual gifts, is to edify the church, to build up the church. It's not about look at me, look at me. It's about what is beneficial for the church. And this whole chapter, he's pleading and making his case for uh, the reason is that the number one thing is the preaching and the teaching over the word of God is the most important in the church because it edifies the church the most. It tells people about God. It helps us to better understand God and to know God's ways. Uh, listen to here. They also have uh, verse 24. Let's look down at verse 24. It says, but if all prophecy... Uh, so here he's... Let me just go through it first. But if all prophecy... And an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he's saying if that's all we do in the church, and an unbeliever enters, he is convicted by all. He is called into account by all of them. Verse 28, but if there is no interpreter now, someone speaking a tongue, and there's no interpreter, he must be silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. And so all that, again, not to go down the rabbit trail, but to maybe clarify for you this thought that he's saying uh, that prophecy or speaking the word of God is more beneficial for tongues. In fact, he says, look at verse 22. He says, tongues are a sign not to believers, but to unbelievers. Why would that be the case? Why would we speak in different languages to tell people about Christ? If, if say, we're an English-speaking church and Pastor Alex is here, we're not going to have him preach in Spanish. Why would we have a few that would understand what he says the rest of us, it's no good, right? So we would preach and we will teach in English because it's more beneficial to you. So we're not speaking different dialects and languages because it's not beneficial for you. That's for the unbeliever. That's speaking to evangelism, okay? He says prophecy, but prophecy is a sign not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. Why? Who is the teaching and the preaching of the word of God for? I understand preaching in an evangelistic way, right? We want people to come to salvation, but the teaching and the doctrines of the word of God are for who? The believer or the unbeliever? Oh, the, the believer. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and so that's the principal uh, primary focus of, of the church. Okay? So we, we acquire knowledge of God, it says, by the scriptures. But it also says that they may worship him in an acceptable manner. Uh, turn over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Who's got that? Can read it nice and loud for us, please. Don't let John steal all the blessings. I've seen him do it. He'll do it. I can do it. Thank you. That the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonish admonishing one another, all in wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Good. Thank you. And thank you for reading verse 17 because that's, that's awesome. Love that verse. Uh, but look at the list there, right? 
this is what should be done. These are manners. This is one area in which we see some listed manners of how it is appropriate to worship God. Do you see it? Teaching. Teaching what? The Word of God. Admonishing one another. When we admonish one another, what does that mean? What does it mean to admonish someone? If I come up here and I admonish you, what, is that? what does that mean? Somebody uh, tell us? Sorry, I heard something. What, what was that? Warning. I still can't Warning. hear. Warning. Okay. Good. Yep, it, and that's exactly right. It's like a strong warning, right? An enthusiastic warning. I'm admonishing you. I'm urging you, warning you of this, um, to stay away from this, or warning you to stay in this, right, in these things of God, and not to get out of them, okay? And, and so we would, our admonishment then should come from what? Should my admonishment come from just what I think John should be doing with his life? And so I yell at him and tell him, dude, you should be doing this? No, he shouldn't listen to me at all, right? Unless it's coming from the Word of God. That's the point. Admonish and teach from the Word of God. It says uh, psalms, right? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So if we have rich songs and hymns and spiritual songs, where would, where would the doctrine and the theology of the words or the lyrics of those songs come from? Word. From the Word, from the Scriptures, okay? Um, as I'm practicing this morning with, uh, with Matt, you know, and I just look forward to to singing and praising and worshiping with all of you next hour, to, to sing these songs and these hymns and these spiritual songs that we sing. So we see that this is, that's why the liturgy of our worship service is what it looks like. And so what I mean by liturgy is kind of like the order of service, what we do in church. How do we decide what we do on Sunday morning, right? It didn't just, somebody didn't just throw something against the wall, just stuck, and that's what we do. And we've changed it over the last several years. For those of you who have been here for, say, five years or more, You've seen that we've changed our liturgy and our structure of service. Why is that? Because it should be lined up to, to lined up to see what we see in the Bible, right? We have readings of scriptures. We have songs that, that sing and praise um, the, the words and, and sound theology. We have a time of giving because we see that in the, in the New Testament that giving was done on the Lord's Day. On the, it says on the first day of the week when the church will gather, they would bring uh, their alms and their gifts to the church and their support to God's uh, work. So we have those things. Preaching, right? The preaching is obviously the first and focal point. So we won't add a lot of things because you're not, uh, I would dare to say, it's hard to always to use the words like always and never and not get caught up in it maybe later on. But I would dare to say you will never see, for as long as I'm here, and the pastors I think that are here would agree, you're never going to see us pull up a skit team on the stage. You're never going to see us uh, you know, do these theatrical things that, that we could do as a little show or a uh, lesson to, to then use into going into teaching a message or tell, talking something about it. We're not going to use those types of things. And we'll get into to that again more later uh, when we talk about the regulative principle and the normative principle of worship and why we view it the way we view it. But does that make sense? Yeah. These are the ways, that the things that we see that are acceptable manners of worship. Uh, look over at Romans. Excuse me. Flip over to the left to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15 verse 4. Paul says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction." So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. So uh, that's the last verse we've got listed in this paragraph here is Romans 15.4. And what does it say there? It says, it is written for what purpose is one of the purposes? Because we talked about some, right? The primary purpose and objective of scripture being written is to save people, Right? So there's many purposes to the scriptures to save us, to sanctify us. We've talked about those. What does it say here is another purpose? Instructions. For our instruction. For our instruction of what? Living our lives. Good. Yeah. To instruction on how to live your lives. And I would say that that, in light of Romans 12, 2, would be an act of worship. Right? Let's, let's flip over there. We're in Romans. Go to, go to left one page or two. Look at Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. Bucket list verses right there. Those are good ones to commit to memory. 
Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. I like the King James. I think it says, it is your reasonable service. It's reasonable that this is what you do. Present your body a living sacrifice to God. That's reasonable. Look, he died for you. You should live for him. That's reasonable, right? It's unreasonable that he took on your sin and laid down his life on the cross and took the wrath of God upon him for you. That's unreasonable and crazy. That's crazy love and an indescribable love, uh, you know, that we really can't even fathom, right? But it's our reasonable service that we would be committed to him. And verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that good and acceptable and perfect. So don't be conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. How, how do you renew your mind? How does that happen? Read the word. Can we just download new things? We can delete things. Unfortunately, we can't. I wish that we could. Anybody else wish they could delete uh, memories and baggage and things that they have before they become a believer? I got lots of it. Um, that doesn't happen. And, it's, and that's also beneficial for our sanctification process and our testimony as well, right? But renewing your mind. You, you've got to renew your mind. You've got to get out the old junk and stop feeding it the old junk, right? Get rid of the junk food and all the junk food you used to love. Now eat the good stuff and, and eat on the stuff that gives you life, uh, that gives you good health and makes you feel bigger and better and stronger and, and healthier and, and to do the right things. And so I tie that into to what he was saying here in Romans 15, 4, that it is uh, encouragement and that it's written for us to give us instruction. Right? Instruction on how we are to live life. And what their focus is here is our instruction on how to worship God. Right? This is how we worship God. Uh, and then there's many, there, there's even believers, you know, more um, immature, let's say in the faith, you know, newer believers and, and less mature believers that are, are possibly not worshiping God properly. And so, and, and to their ignorance a lot of times. And so that's, that's the key of growing and maturing and certainly having others to disciple us and to help us is to grow into maturing and understanding more who God is and how to worship him properly and how to live life properly. And, and as Paul says, Ephesians 4, uh, verse 1, to live a life worthy of the calling by which we've been called. Well, that's something we grow into understanding, right? Is that something that you are saved and you just immediately know how no. to do? No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so we've got to be continued, continually to strive uh, to, to be more Christ-like. And, and so, you know, getting to, to know more God's word and being taught by others that are more mature than us or uh, more knowledgeable in an area than us can be certainly, uh, certainly helpful. Actually, I think of an example now of scripture where Apollos, uh, who became a leader in, in the church uh, around uh, Macedonia area and around Asia and in different areas, but Paul... And uh, Aquila and Priscilla are on a, a, a trip, and they make their journey over to Ephesus. Uh, Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla are hanging out. Paul leaves, and uh, he is preaching and teaching. This Apollos is teaching about Jesus. And it says he's knowledgeable and knows the ways of the Jews, and he teaches great. Uh, but it says he did not know some different things about the teaching. And so Aquila and Priscilla took him over to the side later and talked to him and spoke to him. And it says, taught him greater in the ways of Christ. And so that's the key, is he wasn't knowledgeable about certain things. He was very knowledgeable in the things he was speaking of, but he didn't know other things. And so this brother and sister come alongside of him and say, hey, and, and they teach him these things from the scripture. And, and so now he is growing to be more effective in his ministry, which he becomes a pastor. He's an elder in the churches. So it's beneficial, right? We need one another. We help one another. Uh, that's Proverbs 27, 17. That's what it's all about, that iron, as iron sharpens iron, so too a man sharpens another man slash woman, right, person, uh, that we're to sharpen one another and help one another in, in our understanding, our perception of the Word of God. So we got five minutes. Uh, I'm not going to get in the next paragraph. We're going to do that next week. So uh, what are you guys' thoughts, comments, inputs on, on that last part or anything in paragraph eight or any of the preceding um, paragraphs as well? Inputs, comments? The, on the renewing of your mind, Yeah. You, um, when, when you get converted, whatever, when the Holy Spirit comes into you, or, not, you know, it's when you're active, let's say you're living in the Spirit, when you, when you renew your mind, that allows your body 
because physically your mind is in your body, it allows your body to follow more closer to the spirit. You know what I'm saying? It's like a conversion. Because you're okay, I'm, I'm spirit, you know, the spirit has opened my eyes, I'm, bl I'm not blind anymore. Good. I can see. But I'm still doing the things of the world, you know, I'm still having my fun. So by renewing your mind, you renew it, and it kind of ties you, takes you over yeah. a little bit more to the spiritual side. So your body will start acting more spiritually. Yeah, and that's the goal, right? Yeah. Uh, as Paul talks about, put off the old man and put on the new man. The that tug of war, you know, that I'm always talking about, that battle, that struggle that every single one of us has going on inside of us. I know you do because I do. Uh, you're, you're a person. And so you struggle with sin. You struggle with your flesh. You struggle with the God of this world who has blinded the mind and the hearts of, of men, as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 4. Um, you know, but that, that God, that Jesus has illumined us. He has brought us out into the light of, of revealing this to us. And so, yeah, it's not a it's not an all revelation of, right, here's the bright fullness of the light the moment you're converted. That's just not how the Lord chose to do it. He shows you the light, which is salvation, right? And now, like you said, you're enlightened, you're illumined, and that's why we call it regeneration. That's why it's called conversion. That's why it's the new birth. You've been born again. You're a new creature, um, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So uh, with that being said, it's a process, and we grow in the light, right? we got to keep growing in the light. Uh, there's a DC Talk song, right, Matt? In the light. I know that's a fave of yours. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is a process that so we got to continue to to ask the Holy Spirit, and that's another key. With the Holy Scriptures, we have this gift of the Word. It is what God has chosen to use to, to reveal Himself to us, to grow us, to be more like Him. But He's also given us the gift of His Spirit that is our comforter, is our helper, uh, is our teacher, right? Paul yep. talks about in Corinthians that the Holy, you don't need no man to teach you because you have the Holy Spirit. He's not saying don't allow men to teach you. That We know later he talks in many places that men are, are gifted to teach and we want that. As long as, it line, as long as the teachers you're listening to line up with the Holy Spirit that is the teacher within you through the Word of God, then you're okay, right? But that's what we got to continue to weigh out. And so how are you going to know that? you got to continue to grow in the scriptures. you got to continue to grow in God's ways and his word to know that more. So that's that continual illumination, you know, in that process of sanctification. Good. Anything else? Any other thoughts, comments, questions? No, no, yes, yes, good. All right. Well, I'm encouraged. <clears throat> I pray that you're encouraged. Um, I, I just, Matt and I were talking about this this morning, so I got two minutes, so I'll just share. Brian and I talk about it often. Matt and I talk about it often. Uh, just the fact of, and you hear Brian actually say it, I think this way, you know, old the old dead guys. Me and Brian talk about the old dead guys. I hear Stephen Lawson uh, say, you know, his best friends are these old dead men. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, George Whitfield. You know, just on and on, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Martin Luther. I mean, we could, I could go on and on and on with the names of men throughout church history that God is using great ways and in different ways. Uh, and not that they're any greater than, than anyone else, right? Because they're just men. So whether it's Moses or Martin Lloyd-Jones, they're still men and they still struggle. And so we see that with them. But the point is that we glean from them. We learn from them. And, and so it is good to have those teachers and have those things and as Matt talks about hymns and songs, and we talk about, uh, you know, preachers and teachers of old and of renown and just their languages and listening to their stuff, I find I just continue to grow and grow and grow over the years. It's just so much more encouraging uh, to me and edifying to me that these things are, again, God preserves them. Uh, I'm reading a book on George Whitfield now. I've, you know, read some of Spurgeon's um, sermons and listen to some of his sermons and other men's sermons you can go and get that it's at access on the internet and you just it's so encouraging it's so empowering to see like man god is so good you know and that he didn't stop at at the book of revelation and stop there in the first century but yet this these last 19 20 centuries since then he continues to work and when we read writings like this from 1689 a couple hundred years ago to see what they believe and to say like, amen, 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 amen. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. It's encouraging, isn't it? It's encouraging to know this isn't something that just started with us and that we're just hoping continues to go and we continue to perpetuate, right? You get, I don't know if I'm 
saying the point I'm trying to make that I understand in my own heart and my mind and uh, that it's hard to articulate. But find courage and find encouragement and, and understand that God's been working throughout church history for all ages uh, since Moses was in the church, you know, in the wilderness with the church until now. Um, that, that he's continued this work. He's preserved it. He's the one doing it. Praise and honor and glory be to him uh, for all of eternity. And uh, so be encouraged in, in that. And every time we open the 1689 or these confessions and creeds or you hear old hymns and songs that you might sing and you might be like, man, I don't, that's an old word that I haven't really used before. I don't know what that is. Learn what it means. You know, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what it means. And it's okay to say thou wilt and meaning that you are. And, you know, just not to, to disconnect from church history and say like, no, nope, we're the most important, we're in the most important age of, and time of the period of the church. And we're so focused on just us. And I find that that's a big problem in the contemporary church today. That's just a huge problem. Don't disconnect. Connect. Connect. We're not, we're not rethinking everything here. We're not, we're not rethinking and remaking this thing. We want to continue what's always been being done and always been led by the Holy Spirit of God through men that are obedient to him. And let's continue in those things and continue to build and grow ourselves on those things. So I'm preaching, so I'll stop. Unless that spurs anybody else comment or input, we will uh, we'll pray and we'll close. In that uh, verse, uh, nothing new under the sun, right? Yeah. As far as keeping... Good. Yeah, we're not that English. Good. Yeah. Or that saying, what is it? Uh, you know, if you don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's already here. Let's use it. Like, we need to continue, I think, to going back to the foundations and fundamentals yep. and sticking true to the things that we've seen the Orthodox Church has stuck through for 21 centuries. <laughs> Good. All right. Jay, would you close us, please, brother? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Uh-huh. Help any unbelief that we have in our minds and any doubts. Please straighten our paths. Help us to remain strong mm -hmm. with assurance in what we believe and yep. why we believe it. Help us to hold each other accountable. Put our trust in you. Help us to persevere in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother.